Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Fran Pavley, and welcome to our speakers, our legislators, and virtual attendees to a briefing on offshore wind for California. The USC Schwarzenegger Institute is honored to help host this event and to share with you the Institute's informative offshore wind report with a comprehensive economic analysis. After hearing from Governor Schwarzenegger, opening speakers from academia, the CEC chair, a wind industry representative, as well as an author of the offshore wind energy bill that's going through the legislature, we will hear from a response panel after that, made up of a legislator and voices from labor and the environmental justice community before finally opening it up to Q&A. If people in the audience have questions they'd like to ask, time permitting, uh, they should be submitted in writing and directed to one of all of our speakers. And you can go to the Q&A box on your computer to do so. The recently released IPCC report reminds us all of the urgent need to dramatically reduce our reliance on fossil fuels. How can we accelerate near-term reductions and not wait to 2045 or 2050 to reach net zero emissions? I am concerned that we can't rely on aspirational goals and pledges to reach these targets. The dramatic and deadly events we are witnessing in 2021 from wildfires, floods, and extreme heat are coming sooner than scientists or the public had predicted. Ramping up renewable energy to meet our 100% targets and ramping up storage is part of the solution. That's why we are here today. Businesses, labor, community advocates, local, state, and federal government officials will all need to work together to increase energy efficiency and to accelerate the transition to cleaner sources of energy. I think we can all agree that wind energy is part of the solution and our future. So let's get to it. Kicking off the offshore wind briefing will be Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger, one of my climate heroes. His goal is to terminate both air and climate pollution, both locally and globally, and I wouldn't mess with him. It was over 15 years ago, frankly, on World Environment Day in 2005 in San Francisco that Governor Schwarzenegger stated, the debate is over, climate change is real, and we know what causes it. How come not everyone in Washington, D.C. has gotten that message? He signed at that occasion, an executive order to announce bold new near, mid, and long-term targets to reduce climate pollution. I have to admit, that caught my attention. I borrowed, and that's in quotes, I took or borrowed his near-term 20% reduction targets for 2020 and it amended a bill I had already introduced on mandatory reporting of greenhouse gas emissions by major emitters. It was called AB 32 and the rest is history. A cap on emissions with enforceable targets created a market for investment and innovation. Thanks to many of you in our virtual room today, we are meeting and exceeding the governor's vision. And yet we know we need to do more and faster. Please welcome everyone's climate hero, Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger. So anyway, I was just saying that it was interesting that we are doing this briefing here today because this morning, I had the chance to work out with my very good friend, Michael Regan, who is the EPA secretary in the United States now under the Obama administration. He and I, we became very good friends. We're helping each other. And he delivered a really powerful message also for our Vienna conference. And uh, so anyway, it was really great to pump up the muscles there and at the same time talk actually about this project here and about our briefing today. So that's number one I wanted to tell you. And he is now very much aware of what we are trying to accomplish. And we, of course, in order to execute that, we need his help. So this is why I wanted to brief him on that already early on this morning after our pump at Gorge Gym. Uh, the second thing that I want, I'm off here now again. I don't know if this is okay. Um, You're still in there. Okay, good. So the second thing I want to say is that I also just came back a month ago from the Vienna Conference from our Austrian World Climate Summit. And that was a very, very successful summit. And I can tell you that the private sector is really moving very, very powerfully ahead. 
with the whole thing. And I've, I couldn't really, uh, because of the lack of energy that I see worldwide sometimes and in the public sector, I couldn't uh, stop bragging about California. I, I always do that wherever I go. California has been the world leader in the battle for clean air. I think it goes back to Ronald Reagan, who created the Air Resources Board in 1967. And I always tell them that. And uh, this was actually the year before I even moved to the United States. And since then, of course, it built with Jerry Brown and all the other governors moved us forward. And then, of course, we, during our administration, did the same thing. You know, we had big goals. We have all seen governments around the world now take one step forward and two steps back when it comes to environmental issues and to terminate pollution, basically. And it's really upsetting to watch that because we've seen too many countries set ambitious environmental goals, but they fa fail to deliver. As a matter of fact, uh, just recently we heard that 70% of the countries worldwide uh, have not really accomplished their goals uh, that they set out in 2015 at COP21. So that's really a sad situation. And that's why I brag about California, because in California, we only move forward and we always deliver on our promises. That's what differentiates us from the rest of the world. I mean, when we set our goal, as uh, you know, friend, as I eloquently put it, you know, to reduce emissions by 25% by the year 2020, which we did in 2006, we achieved it. We not only achieved it, but we achieved it two years early. And then we had a vision, a big vision of a 1 million solar roofs, blanketing the entire state with clean energy. We succeeded and we achieved that goal early and on the budget. But we also know that our work is not finished. That's why we are doing this briefing here today because we got to move forward until every California kid can breathe clean air until the smog that is hanging still over Los Angeles, now Central Valley, and many other major cities all over will give way to blue skies. And that's why we keep reaching for bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger goals. And that is why our state will be powered completely by clean energy by the year 2045, because we have a plan and we follow that plan. We know that we have much more work to do to clean up our pollution from transportation. And we need to do everything that we can to replace our gas fueled cars and trucks with clean alternatives. The work does not stop until the smog is something that our kids read about in history books. So today I am so proud to highlight and to be part of this briefing here, to highlight another innovative clean energy solution at the Schwarzenegger Institute. Offshore wind has great potential to provide huge amount of clean energy, huge amount of clean energy. It is something that will save us all. I mean, the most energy we have ever used in California is approximately, I think it was 50,000 megawatts in 2006 just to show you how many megawatts they'd be using at the, at the height. Now here with this proposal that you were here today, there's 10,000 additional megawatts of wind energy that will allow us to take a large percentage of this fossil fuel all offline and to increase our renewable percentage to 70%, so from 50 to 70%. So these are really staggering numbers. And this is what Ronald, I mean, uh, Michael Regan was so excited about today. But this is not the only exciting thing that I have to tell you. When I read through the briefings, I was so taken by it. They will make our grid more resilient so that we never have to worry about blackouts in the future. And it will create, listen to this, 65,000 great jobs in construction to build those windmills and almost 5,000 jobs to maintain the wind farms. This is big time because we always say we want to protect the environment and protect also our economy. California will keep leading the way on clean jobs. There's no two ways about it. And also with our revenues and with our economy. We will save over a billion dollars in energy costs on top of that. There's another thing that excites me. And then of course we will go and take pollution out of the air. Yes, we will reduce pollution it is an equivalent of taking over a million cars off the road. That is what this would accomplish. The US right now, so you know, and I'm sure all of you know, has 28,000 megawatts of offshore wind right now, 28,000. 
Now, this 10,000 we're talking about here today, this 10,000 megawatts, will take us to 38,000 megawatts of wind and to make us a world leader. Isn't that great? Because we always talk about what's going on in America. I mean, are we losing the edge? No, this will make us a world leader. This is the great thing about it. And I love that the undersea cables that come from those windmills and that they deliver the power to shore will never cause wildfires. You know why? Because they will not be exposed like the, the transmission lines are today that caused the historic wildfires, the biggest wildfires in America, in, in California history, the campfire, the Dixie fire is all because of falling power lines, all of the trees falling on the power lines. So we can do much better than that. So the bottom line is that all over the world, when they talk to those leaders, they're missing a plan. They make great goals, but they don't have a plan on how to get there. And they don't have an air resources board like we have. And they don't have smart people like uh, Senator Fran Barfley, of course. So okay. California has a plan. That is the bottom line. And this is no different than when I was in bodybuilding. I, I, yes, I could say at the age of 15, I want to be the bodybuilding champion of the world. But I had to have a plan. And I had a plan. Exactly how much weight I have to uh, lift every day, how many reps I have to do, how many sets I have to do, what kind of exercises I have to do, what kind of a diet I have to be in. All of this, there was a plan. And that's why at the age of 20, I became the youngest world champion in bodybuilding ever, because there was a plan. So this is what this is all about. So I just, I'm thanking the world of what you guys are doing. I want to say thank you to David Hochschild, the chair of the California Energy uh, Commission, and Professor Adam Rose and Professor Dan Wei, who wrote this fantastic report. I want to thank you all for doing such an unbelievable job with this report. It is really wonderful. And the world will be shocked when they see our new plan. And now I'm excited to hear from Senator Fran, Fran Powerfully and also all the other experts. And Fran, I just want to say again that you were such an unbelievable partner when I was governor of the state of California. You and I worked together like a jewel. You wrote most of the legislation. There's no two ways about that. I Maybe mean, out that we wouldn't have had anything. This is why so many times I say there's no such thing as a self-made man. I by myself couldn't have done any of that. You were there by my side, and I was showing to the world that a conservative, a Republican can work with the Democrats, the liberals, and have, have a powerful joint kind of a working relationship where we get things done. This, let me tell you something, this wind energy that we're talking about here will be another powerful weapon in our fight to terminate pollution once and for all. So thank you very much, all of you. And now I want to hand it back to you, uh, in a Senator Parfley. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Governor. Great speech as usual, very inspirational. Now I want to do even more. And um, let's keep working together because uh, under your leadership, you've shown it's a bipartisan measure when it comes to pollution, whether it's climate change or air pollution, they, it, the pollution doesn't care whether you're Republican or Democrat or anything right. like that And the solution. So we have to make the world a better place. And with your leadership, uh, you inspire all of us to do more. So thanks so much for spending part of your day with us. And we're going to go on right to our main speakers and so let's uh, bring up that chairman from the uh, California Energy Commission, David Hochschild. You know, he's been around the CEC since 2013 and he was appointed 2019. And David will correct me if I'm wrong with any of this by Governor Newsom where he served as chair since then. He's been involved in both the private and public sector relating to solar energy fields for the past 20 years. And that's a great background for it. I know David as someone who's bright, high energy, articulate and compassionate, but the perfect person to help lead California's efforts towards a sustainable future. So David, help lead us off. Let us hear well, thank you, in California. Thank you, Senator, for that uh, generous eulogy and uh, good yeah. to be with you. And, and Governor, thank you. I just wanna say, you know, in our country, we have a surplus of carbon and a shortage of courage, particularly political courage to take on climate solutions the way they need to be. And uh, you've shown incredible vision and passion and commitment. You know, I'm mindful of the fact that uh, when the Million Solar Roofs goal was set uh, some years ago uh, during, during the Schwarzenegger administration, you know, a lot of people dismissed it 
as mythology. And today we're at 1.3 million solar roofs. We're adding 400 solar roofs a day. And solar is the cheapest and fastest growing energy source in the world. Uh, and it's just a tribute to the, the tenacity. Um, and I think it, it speaks to California's role as an incubator of new technologies. I think we're seeing this now with electric vehicles. Uh, we're making over a thousand electric vehicles a day in California. EVs became our number one export uh, last year in the state. Uh, and we need to lean in to this future. It has a lot of benefits for our economy as well as for air quality. Um, offshore wind is an area I am really excited about because I think the benefits are colossal. And actually, if you step back and look at the country as a whole, actually almost 80% of electric demand in the United States today is in coastal states, if you include the states surrounding the Great Lakes. Uh, and so this is an amazing resource. And of course, within a coastal state like California, most of the load is coastal. San Diego, Los Angeles, Oakland, San Francisco, San Jose, right? The coastal load. And so the prospect of putting uh, offshore wind turbines um, off the coast of California has all kinds of benefits. I would argue that after rooftop solar, offshore wind is the single lowest impact form of energy generation in the world. Uh, there's very few birds and so forth uh, 20 miles offshore. And this agreement we just came to with the Biden administration. Um, uh, we had tried under Trump, didn't get anywhere. We got a deal uh, with the Biden administration uh, just recently this spring. Uh, this is for a site that's 400 square miles off the central coast, 20 miles offshore to 30 miles offshore. So it's a zone that's that far out, you know, really largely out of sight uh, and can generate uh, many gigawatts of clean electricity. And what people don't realize is that Offshore wind as a resource is significantly better than wind on land. So typically wind turbines on land are spinning 35 to 40% of the hours of the day. Offshore wind is in more in the range of 55 to 60%. Uh, and it's happening at a time that is really, really uh, needed. It's really sort of a yin yang with uh, wind solar is producing. So offshore wind, the resource in California is up in the morning, goes down the middle of the day and then comes up in the afternoon and evening and really is a beautiful complement to all the solar that's coming in. It's going to help us get off fossil fuels even faster. Uh, and the, the entire offshore wind industry is now moving to a 15 megawatt platform and, and will probably be uh, even larger than that down the road. So incredible innovation happening. This is not a technology where we are leading yet. So to be clear, Europe is way ahead of us. The United Kingdom has 38 offshore wind projects. Uh, we don't have a single one on the west coast of the United States. We only have one installed on the east coast of Rhode Island. So we got a long way to go. But once we turn our focus to this, I believe we can scale and get a very sizable uh, deployment of this technology off the west coast that will help position it to grow even faster around the world and get that innovation uh, engine really ramped up. Um, we are leading on electric vehicles. We're leading on, on renewables on land. We're leading on energy efficiency. We just adopted the strongest uh, and boldest uh, efficiency code for new construction uh, in the United States last week here at the Energy Commission. And offshore wind, when I look ahead, is one of the most important and most exciting areas of growth. I wanted to particularly thank uh, my colleagues and friends in the legislature, particularly Assemblyman David Chu, who's been visionary on this issue, pushing this legislation forward and really excited to, uh, to get to work on, on building out this infrastructure and, and making a model for the rest of the country and the world. And thanks again to the Schwarzenegger team uh, who did this study and all their, their hard work. Thank you, David. That was an excellent way to kick off the panel. So let's go on to the authors of the report. That would be Professors Adam Rose and Dan Way. And they're gonna present key findings from their recent study of California's offshore wind potential. I wanted to just give a special note of thanks to the Energy Foundation for their assistance in funding this research, very important. Both Professor Rose and Professor Way are research professors in USC so Price School of Public Policy, and we look forward to your overview from your report on the challenges and opportunities of offshore wind off the coast of California. Welcome, Adam and Dan. Good afternoon. I'm very happy to be here virtually today to summarize the report on California's offshore wind electricity opportunity. 
I'm going to be sharing the presentation with my colleague, Professor Dan Way, but we'd also like to acknowledge our graduate assistant on this uh, study, Adam Einbinder, who was a uh, graduate student in the economics department at USC. So California Senate Bill 100 calls for supplying all the electricity sold in California from carbon free technologies by the year 2045. And thus far uh, until recently, the prime candidates were solar, land-based wind, geothermal, along with energy storage and others. But recently offshore wind has been added to the mix. And in fact, we're talking about 10 gigawatts of installed capacity by the year 2040. Uh, moreover, uh, offshore wind has recently obtained Biden administration support. There's been mentioned today of the landmark agreement recently signed with the state of California. This calls for loans to industry uh, for construction of offshore wind facilities and also seaport capacity expansion to be able to bring in the large pieces of equipment. Uh, we've uh, two areas have been designated as prime sites for offshore wind in California. These are Morro Bay and Humboldt County. And these have been designated by the US Bureau of Ocean Energy Management and also mentioned in President Biden's recent announcement. Uh, in effect, what we performed was a benefit cost analysis of the inclusion of offshore winds in the energy mix for the next couple of decades. And this consists of direct benefits in terms of lowering electricity prices and several co-benefits. So the first two improved electricity reliability and reduction in greenhouse gases to many would be considered just as important as lowering electricity prices. And so we've made them the, the primary area of, of co-benefits in our analysis. In addition, we're looking at reduction in ordinary air pollution, reduction in environmental impacts from land-based energy, environmental justice gains, the job creation that's been mentioned, and the formation of industrial clusters surrounding offshore wind. So to be specific, the value proposition inherent in, in evaluating the basic uh, primary benefit is what can be gained by including offshore wind energy in the electricity mix. And the findings by the California Energy Commission were on the order of 1 billion annually. And in that case, we, we basically depended on their assessment. The, the rest of the analysis was work that we performed on our own. So we also would find improved reliability of electricity services due to uh, higher and more stable capacity factors and the timing of peak availability of wind. Essentially, the wind blows offshore is the strongest as the sun goes down. So it's a wonderful complement to wind and is able to improve our reliability and reap these savings by the uh, substitution and closing down of uh, gas-fired peaker plants. As far as the job gains, we've got as many as uh, 195 job years added for construction, uh, 4,000 to 4,500 annual operation and maintenance jobs for 40 years. That translates into an additional 120 to 180 job years. Uh, the reduction of nearly 5 million metric tons of CO2 translates into $340 million of reduced climate change damages. We also have uh, obviously the reduction in land-based impacts in comparison to offshore wind and centralized solar and improvements in, vir in environmental justice through the reduction in ordinary air pollution in poor neighborhoods and the construction of offshore wind facilities in lagging regions. So again, the value proposition is the cost of generating electricity without a given technology minus the cost of generating it with the technology, in this case, offshore wind. Uh, that $1 billion figure was uh, essentially estimated by a joint California agency report headed up by the California Energy Commission. And it is also backed up by a report done by a firm called Energy and Environmental Economics Incorporated, which found that we'd have up to $2 billion in net present value savings 
between 2030 and 2040, even with slightly less than 10 uh, megawatts of uh, gigawatts of additional capacity. I don't expect people to read the diagram below, but just get the general feel of it. And one of the things that's contributing to this is the historical trend and the projections of lowering of the annualized cost of offshore wind. This is a combination of the capital construction costs and operating costs. And now I'll turn this over to my uh, colleague, Professor Danway, to focus primarily on the job impacts. Dan, I'll hit yeah. the next slide for you. All right, thank you. So we can go to the next slide. So in uh, this study, we conducted the economic impact analysis of the development of um, 10 gigawatts of offshore wind. So um, three gigawatts by 2030 and um, a total of 10 gigawatts um, of installed capacity by 2040 in five areas of the coast of California. So this include um, the three core areas originally de uh, designated by the Bureau of um, Ocean Energy Management. So um, our major data source um, is the um, disaggregate capital expenditures and operation and maintenance costs of commercial scale offshore wind projects in California um, that are pre uh, presented in the most recent um, NREL offshore wind technical report. And we also collected um, estimates on transmission costs from various sources. And um, a 76 sector um, input output model uh, was used in this study. And the IO model is the most widely used analytical approach to analyze the economic impacts of offshore wind development in the literature. And uh, one very important consideration in the economic impact analysis is the extent to which the equipment, as well as the components of the offshore wind generation uh, system can be manufactured and uh, supplied by the producers within the state. So in this study, we analyzed the two scenarios, um, a, a lower bound and upper bound scenarios based on different assumptions uh, of the in-state shares of equipment supplies. And again, uh, those assumptions are based on um, a survey studies conducted by NREL in which the researchers um, conducted interviews with market experts in California and very comprehensive assessment of the offshore wind development capacity in the state. And then uh, we can move to the next slide. So this slide presents the simulation results. Um, the first table, the table on top, presents the impacts stemming from the capital expenditures during the construction and installation phases um, of the projects. So the results are presented um, in terms of um, employment uh, impacts, um, GSB uh, gross state product impacts, uh, output uh, or sale revenue impacts, and also impacts on personal income. Um, and uh, we can look at the numbers, the results in the last two columns, and we can see that between 2020 and 2040, um, the scenario of the uh, 10 gigawatts um, offshore wind development is estimated to increase employment by uh, 97,000 to 195,000 job years. Um, and the second table uh, presents the impacts, the annual economic impacts associated with the operation and maintenance of um, those offshore wind facilities. So uh, we see that upon full uh, implementation, again, if we um, you know, focused on the last two columns here. Um, upon the full implementation uh, of the uh, 10 gigawatts operating capacity, um, an additional of 4,000 to 4,500 um, maintenance operation and maintenance jobs will be created. And those jobs will, be, uh, will, will last over the entire lifetime of those facilities. Um, so moving to the uh, last um, slide. Um, so there are some challenges that need to be addressed in order to, um, in order for the offshore wind to reach its full potential in the state. So um, some example challenges include to minimize um, adverse impacts on marine and coastal environments and ocean wildlife species uh, during both the construction and operation phases, 
and also to uh, uh, minimize the um, impacts to military operations, especially in central uh, call areas, uh, central coastal call areas, um, such as you know um, identifying some zones like in the Morro Bay 399 zones that are more you know compatible with the military activities. And there are also the need to invest in additional transmission infrastructures, especially to um, deliver the um, electricity, offshore wind electricity generated in uh, northern coast uh, projects to um, the major load centers in the state, and also to develop um, specialized seaport to serve as the hub, uh, hubs of uh, manufacturing and assembly of uh, those uh, gigantic um, uh, equipment of offshore wind generation. Um, it is also very important to develop um, California wind power supply chain um, to lead to um, a commercial scale and um, better uh, cost competitiveness of the technology, and also to help to bring um, good paying jobs to the state as well as the hosting uh, local communities. So uh, we see that all, all of these uh, challenges are being addressed through uh, very comprehensive assessment studies of the technology, the development of strate strategic plans um, in the state, and also ongoing collaborative efforts um, from stakeholders, um, OSW, uh, offshore wind energy um, industries, as well as state, local, and federal agencies. So um, thank you. Thank you, Dan. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much, both uh, Adam and Dan. Excellent presentation. If everyone, anyone wants to see uh, the full report, please contact uh, Allison Kay, or I think it was attached to your registration form, and you can read it in depth. A lot of information to absorb and, and uh, very informative. Thank you, and extremely timely. So let's go on to our next speaker on our top five, as I call them. Um, this is Assembly Member David Chu, and he hails from the San Francisco area, um, represents about a half million people in that Bay Area city. I think he's in his fourth term in the Assembly. He'll correct me if I'm wrong, and serves as chair of the Assembly Housing and Community Development Committee. David Chu is the lead author of AB 525, the Offshore Wind Bill, now in the state Senate. Please, David, give us an update on your bipartisan bill. I saw it's getting through your committees fairly easily. There's a lot of support. Knock on wood. Well, first of all, I want to thank all of you who helped to organize uh, the discussion this afternoon and to our former Senator Pavley. Fran, we really miss you. Wish you were still in the legislature, uh, but for term limits, we should make an exception for you. But appreciate your leadership uh, more broadly on these issues. And to our former governor, I just want to thank you for, for seeing the bleak future of climate crisis and your ongoing leadership in this area. So folks have asked me, why did I introduce this bill? And, and fundamentally, and there are a lot of things we can talk about when it comes to policy, um, but I started focusing on this because of my five-year-old son. Um, I think a lot about the fact that when my kid gets older, I know that he and his friends are going to ask me, they're going to ask us, did we do everything we could to address climate crisis? And I think we all want to be able to say that we did everything that we could. And Governor Schwarzenegger referred to a world that the next generation is going to live in, and, and, and we have a responsibility. Um, so a couple of years ago, we started looking for big ideas and came upon this one. And, and really, it was in the context of years of, of heat waves and wildfires and rolling blackouts and the fact that during this recession, we've lost a million jobs. We came across this once in a generation opportunity, which is just 20 to 30 miles off our coast to address climate change and to put people back to work. Because the fact of the matter is we have access to one of the world's greatest untapped sources of renewable energy. And offshore wind has the potential to combat climate change, meet our clean energy goals that uh, our good senator and the governor helped to set and provide good paying jobs. So um, we introduced AB 525 to really jumpstart a new industry in California to direct the state to prepare a strategic plan to harness the power of offshore wind. Um, as was alluded to before, we're behind the rest of the state of the world um, and frankly, the rest of the country. Um, and the hope of this bill is that we'll help catch up 
when it comes to offshore wind and really set our state up as a leader in the floating offshore wind industry uh, to make sure that we tap into the benefits of this industry while giving full consideration to our state's marine and coastal ecosystems, prioritizing development in areas that create least conflict out there. Um, now, a couple of things that have been alluded to before, I know David Hochschild referred to the fact that offshore wind is an essential resource for reliability, because we know that solar is only generated during the day, which means that you know, rather than relying on fossil fuel peaker plants at night, um, we can rely on offshore winds that blow consistently in the evening and during the summer when solar resources go offline and demand picks up and really relieve the strain on our electric system. Now, I alluded to the fact that Europe and Asia are far ahead of us in this space. And while our state, we have been a leader in clean energy for a long time, we need to continue to really drive a strong support of transition. And I want to just take a moment and thank the Biden administration, thank Washington, our federal government for the first time in too many years uh, wants to really move us forward. Earlier this year, the president announced a national goal of 30 gigawatts of offshore wind by the year 2030, on the path to 110 gigawatts by 2050. A couple of things I'll just mention on that. These are big goals. Uh, and I really cannot thank the Biden administration for really setting up this big vision. But I'll note that at this moment, if you look at those numbers, right, if we're going to have a shot at, say, 30 gigawatts by 2030 or 110 by 2050, East Coast states right now have a combined pipeline of about 29 gigawatts. California has put zero gigawatts on the map so far. So we've got to contribute our share. And just given how vast our Pacific coastline is, I think that we can contribute at least 10% of this in the next few years. I think we can become a global leader in this new floating offshore wind industry as long as we take advantage of this moment. I'll also mention that the president has proposed funding to upgrade ports and infrastructure to support offshore wind, as well as to fund R&D and debt capital. By the end of 2020, the federal government had approved a 30% investment tax credit for offshore wind through 2025 with safe harbor provisions that can allow for the construction to conclude a decade later. What this means is we have to take advantage of this moment. And our bill AB 525 would put us on track to really contribute to the federal goals, utilize federal programs and credits, and just take advantage of this. So just you know, to wrap up, we got to do this. Um, it's my hope. Uh, at the moment, my bill is in the Senate Appropriations Committee. My hope is that we can get it to the Senate floor uh, in the next couple of weeks. And with a vote of the Senate floor and a concurrence vote back in the Assembly, we can send it to Governor Newsom for his hopeful signature and just get going because we have no time to waste. And uh, again, just appreciate all of the real thought leaders and visionaries and policymakers on this. Together, we can all uh, be uh, heading in the right direction of the wind, uh, chase it down, capture it, and put it to use uh, in saving our planet. So with that, uh, back to Fran Pavley. Thank you, Senator. Hey, thank you, Assemblymember Chu. Excellent, excellent presentation, and I'll be following your bill closely. I assume there'll be no problems in that pesky state senate so <laughs> it'll be back to you for concurrence so uh, really important work that you're doing so thanks so much so let's go on to our last of our five uh, kickoff speakers here i would like to introduce to everyone jonah margulis he is uh, vice chair of the offshore wind california coalition he's senior vice president and u.s country manager of ocker offshore wind that's norwegian-based uh, company He's going to give us some brief remarks, and I heard he's also be sharing a video with this so he can actually see what offshore wind platforms look like, how close they are to the shore. So, uh, Jonah, thank you very much for taking time out of your busy day to join with us today. Well, thanks for the, the wonderful introduction, Fran. Uh, it was, and you said everything right, so good pronunciation. Uh, thank you for that. <laughs> Um, first, I wanted to th say thank you to Assemblymember Chu for his leadership on AB 525. I think everyone's fingers are crossed, knocking on wood, uh, to get that through. We're really uh, excited uh, about that. I just want to double check. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, perfect. Thanks. Well, I can. I maybe know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> I hope everybody I'm can. good. <laughs> perfect. Uh, I also want to thank the co-authors of this report, uh, Professors Adam Rosen and Dan Way. I think it was a tremendously well-written report and, and really laid out the challenges uh, very well. 
uh, and the opportunity. Uh, and as well as the invite to, to speak on this panel, I, I'm certainly humbled uh, to be on this esteemed panel. So Acker Offshore Wind is a leading offshore wind developer focused on the deep water market. Uh, we are part of the Acker group of companies and trace our history back almost a, over 180 years uh, with the last five decades focused on the offshore industry. Our mission is to create a sustainable future driven by clean, green energy. So as an offshore industry, we couldn't be more excited about the opportunity that offshore floating wind provides for California. The Golden State is well positioned to leapfrog from laggard to leader in the global offshore floating wind market. So we've heard from the authors of the study that the job creation potential is quite significant with tens of thousands of construction jobs, uh, thousands more during operation and maintenance of the facilities, especially if we are going to go big and reach our initial targets of 10 gigawatts by 2040. I think the governor said it best, uh, goals are important uh, and, and this is a great goal. But the recent announcement by the Biden administration and the Cal and California governor, Gavin Newsom, to open up the development of up to 4.6 gigawatts of floating wind in Humboldt and Morro Bay uh, call areas is a good start. The industry now has greater certainty that there will be a lease sale, the first lease sale in California in mid 2022. While there are many individuals and organizations to thank at the local, state, and federal level, I think it's really striking to see how much of this has been by bipartisan support uh, throughout the years. And Governor Schwarzenegger actually mentioned that in his remarks. So once developed, the Humboldt call area, which is in the North Coast, could produce up to 1.6 gigawatts of energy, while Morro Bay, the Central Coast of California, could produce approximately three gigawatts. Combined floating wind power in these two areas off the Pacific coast could generate enough electricity to power 1.6 million homes. One unique characteristic of the waters off the coast of California is the steep drop off of the continental shelf. So from a technology perspective, what this means is that floating plat platforms will be required for all wind, form wind farms on the west coast. There are significant advantages to floating wind arrays. Namely, these turbines, which you see in my, my background, if you can see, uh, will be located over 20 miles from shore, so virtually out of sight, over the horizon. As we go further offshore, there are generally less conflicts with other ocean users, which is important when we're sighting. But there remain challenges uh, to ensure that the floating wind market thrives in the West Coast and realizes the economic and other benefits laid out in this study. I recently described some of these challenges, highlighted some of these challenges in an op-ed piece in, in Recharge, but to summarize, there are really three distinct areas uh, that need to be addressed in, in priority. First is port infrastructure. Uh, the ports must be upgraded along, along the West Coast to build and tow out these fairly massive platforms. As an industry, we're certainly encouraged to see the initial state funding towards the Port of Humboldt, uh, but more will be required in the future, no doubt. Second, grid infrastructure. It remains an issue, uh, especially in the north where the wind resource is the best. And third, there is the final hurdle to create a reliable offshore wind supply chain to build and service this market. If we can address these challenges, the industry has the potential to create multi-generational careers in communities that have traditionally not had these opportunities. I think about assembly member two's five-year-old. Uh, I have a five-year-old as well. It's, it's very, very personal. So from my perspective, there's no doubt that these challenges can and will be solved with a continued commitment from industry, the support of governments and engagement of all stakeholders to ultimately uh, realize California as a global offshore floating wind industry leader and provide ample opportunity for the communities where this industry will flourish. So I'll say thank you again for your attention, uh, brief remarks, and, and look forward to answering any questions um, uh, online or, or during a panel session uh, that you may have about this exciting offshore floating wind industry in California. So I'll turn it back to you, uh, Fran. Yeah, thank you very much, Jonah. Excellent job. Uh, former teacher, you, you earned an A on that. I, I grade everything, so thank you for that. Um, let's go on to our response panel. And this was sort of my idea, and we'll see if it works. What I wanted from these next three people 
was their expertise, but their thoughts after listening to those presentations that we just heard of from the five uh, distinguished speakers and um, either offer some comments and response or feel free to ask a question of one of them, assuming they're still uh, with us and available. Um, so I welcome your opinion, but let me give you a brief introduction each, and then we'll put all three of you uh, up and uh, look forward to your response. Um, first of all, Assembly Member Laura Friedman. Uh, she serves the 43rd Assembly District. That's down here in the LA area in Glendale and Burbank. Uh, and prior to election in 2016, she was a mayor and council member in Glendale. She has served as chair of the Assembly Natural Research Committee and now chairs the Assembly Transportation Committee. And she is also a lead author along with Assembly Member Chu on AB 525. And I know she's passionate on environmental and climate issues. The next member of the response panel is Eddie Ahn. Eddie is the executive director for Brightline Defense. Eddie has been engaged in policy and legal advocacy in the Bay Area since 2009. Prior to being a nonprofit attorney, he was a AmeriCorps member, which caught my attention. More recently, he was appointed to serve on the Metropolitan Transportation Commission for the nine Bay Area counties. Great background from Eddie. And uh, the last responder on the SHARE panel is Jeff Hunterlock. Jeff is an important voice for labor and the building trades relating to wind energy. He is the district representative for operating engineers and he's going to be strategically located because he lives in the Humboldt area of California. So welcome to all three of you. Let's start with uh, Laura, some observations, questions, response. We welcome your input. Well, first, uh, Senator Pavley, thank you so much for inviting me. I was very pleased to, to get the invitation. I have to say that it's very it was very inspirational to hear from Governor Schwarzenegger um, and also somewhat uh, guilt inducing because I have not gone to the gym or pumped up um, since I can remember. So I felt, um, you know, both inspired and guilty at the same time. Um, but I was really, really thrilled to hear um, from the panelists. Um, of course, I've been working with uh, David Chu on environmental issues for the past several years and really appreciate his leadership in this area. Um, so I, I'll just give you a little bit of background about what's been happening for the past few years in my, my city in Glendale. Glendale has, an old, uh, Glendale has its own municipal, uh, uh, utility, municipal utility, um, as does Burbank next door and Pasadena on the other side of us. These are older cities that um, did, uh, you know, have their own power generation and struggle with some of the issues um, that a lot of uh, older uh, power plants are struggling with uh, about what they're going to do moving into a clean energy future. Uh, at the same time, Glendale, like some of our surrounding cities, has a lot of issues when it comes to um, uh, transmission into the city. Uh, we're, an, we're an urban area. Um, uh, there's not a lot of available right of way. We've had trouble getting transmission from the city of Los Angeles that's reliable and affordable into the city. So very much reliant in a lot of ways on our own plant as well as what we can get off the grid. So Glendale has an old power plant called Grayson that's been operating for many, many years. And the city, um, the uh, Muni had come to the city council who operates it and asked for permission to refire the plant. And the community uh, actually rose up and said no, that they did not want um, a larger natural gas plant in the community, that they support a, a zero emission future and clean energy. And they wanted the Muni to come back with another plan. So the uh, city went back and did a, a couple of years study and, and came back with a proposal to do a much smaller natural gas uh, high efficiency peaker plant with a lot of storage as well. Uh, but the city is also transmission constrained. So I, I guess my first observation would be that cities like mine are very, very interested in renewable generation. Uh, and by the way, the city is also planning on doing a virtual power plant type model with rooftop solar that would um, uh, tie in with the city's uh, own um, utility and really trying to push the envelope about what they can do with uh, sort of storage in private homes and in ZEVs and, and sort of how far they can push um, a rooftop solar generation and, and making it work with their own um, uh, grid and our smart meters, which is sort of another unexplored opportunity. 
uh, but we are transmission constrained. So we, we have uh, the public appetite for renewable generation. And I think that you'll find that across California that people are very aware of climate change. They really wanna see solutions. They wanna know that they are getting their own power in the most uh, sustainable way possible. So all of that is to say that I think there's a tremendous appetite for offshore wind. There's a tremendous appetite for solar and industrial scale solar, but we know that we've had tremendous siting issues in California and some difficulty really rolling out a lot of industrial scale solar, and it remains to be seen how much of that public pushback we're gonna have with offshore wind. It's, it's a new concept on this coast. Uh, we did see some long battles about offshore wind, I know on the East Coast, and it'll be interesting to see what happens if that solar starts to kind of come down the coast into the more populated areas? Now, I'm going to Portugal in a couple of months to look at one of the lar world's largest offshore wind installations that's going in. Very interested to talk to communities there about what the public uh, feedback has been to those projects. I think it's really important that we as policymakers do go to the early adopters and talk about what lessons they learned about rolling out these kinds of projects in their communities and what they would suggest to us as we start to reach out and talk to our communities. I'm also curious just to see what this, what these projects look like from the shore, what they look like during the day and what they look like at night and what kind of impact they really have. Now, right before, right after that, I'm going to Scotland for the COPE, for the uh, you know uh, conference of parties with the UN of the Paris Accord groups, as California is a subnational that's very interested in talking to the rest of the world. We are the fifth largest economy in the world, right here in California, and we have a lot that we can contribute to the worldwide conversation about how we move forward with clean energy goals. So, very um, interested to go there with this report in hand. And I think the last thing that I would say is that, as it's been said before. Goals are really important, but having data to drive those policy decisions is just as, if not more important. And having reports like has been generated by the Schwarzenegger Institute that give us some of those data points will help us develop those roadmaps that we can follow. I was chairing natural resources and this was very much in my wheelhouse. I'm still on that committee, but now I'm chairing transportation. And a lot of the same concerns and questions are now in the transportation world as we're trying to ramp up, of course, our zero emission and electric vehicles in California. The duck curve could very well change because of the amount of electric vehicles that will be charging at night. And so when we talk about electric vehicles in California, we also often go back to a lot of those same concerns about reliability, about people's ability to charge their vehicles, about uh, having diverse sources of energy in our portfolio, about what role ZEBs themselves can play as storage devices and what, what, what the limitations are on that. So I'm just happy to have partners who are willing to do those deep dives and get us the data that we need as policymakers. And I look forward to continuing the conversation. Thanks so much again, Senator. Yes, well, thank you, Laura. And you bring such a great background and perspective to all this. And thank you for your passion and interest. And have a great time at your first uh, Council of Parties. It'll be second. A one oh, second. second. So what a wonderful experience. Well, with the US back in the game, maybe it'll be a little more. It'll be very different. When I was there, we were in this weird tent outside the main tent. And it kind of felt like the kids table at Thanksgiving. <laughs> and uh, then President Trump sent a sent rep, his representatives were representatives of the coal industry is yeah. what he sent to represent the United States. Yeah, at the COP, and it was this very, might be a little was, bit different. It was a little yeah, it might be a little bit different now. So I'm really looking oh, forward good. to it. Well, thank you, and keep us all informed. Thank and you. I know when you said uh, solar roofs, um, uh, Governor Schwarzenegger's ears probably picked up. So one of his goals is not to stop, but stop at a million, but keep on going along with the storage with it. So thank you very much for attending. Thanks for having me. Today. So let's go on to Eddie on. Um, give us a little perspective from the EJ experience in Brightline Defense, Oakland area. Eddie? Yes, thanks, Senator Padley. Uh, Eddie on again, Executive Director of Brightline. And just for context, we're a nonprofit. We do a blend of programmatic and policy work ranging from things like air quality monitoring to job training in the Bay Area. Uh, we're also, of course, capable of sweeping policy advocacy around offshore wind. But I think above all else, we try not to lose sight of details and local communities. And even now, for instance, as wildfires are sweeping the state, 
We're scrapping together enough materials to try to create do-it-yourself air filtration systems for low-income residents in San Francisco. But I think there's really just two points I wanted to add to all the other speakers that have talked about offshore wind to date. Uh, you've heard repeatedly about jobs uh, being created by offshore wind. And you know, for us uh, as a policy nonprofit, we really focus on jobs in the context of workforce development and particularly local hiring, making sure that you know, the, when we're projecting this many jobs being created from things like port revitalization, transmission line siting, manufacturing and beyond, that we also have an understanding of connecting local underemployed and unemployed communities to these jobs. And ideally they should be, you know, good paying jobs. And I'm sure Jeff Hunterlock of the operating engineers will describe more about what that means that when we have union jobs, we have sustainable careers and that's really important for the communities that we serve. So just understanding that career pathway and connecting it to the workforce development systems that exist locally, whether they're nonprofit organizations, community colleges, technical colleges, uh, all important to loop into this vision and making sure offshore wind developers commit to that will be really important. And then secondly, is just noting the air quality benefits themselves as the environmental justice benefit involved. That as we have things like the nuclear power plant in Diablo Canyon, as well as gas power plants retiring across the state, which are, by the way, are primarily sited in low income communities, that we are taking advantage of that infrastructure and making sure it's connected to offshore wind so that we are serving our coastal cities and making sure we're cleaning up our grid appropriately and not disproportionately impacting our environmental justice communities. Uh, and with that, I'll just conclude uh, that uh, Brightline has been working on this issue for some time, will be continued uh, in our engagement of it because we really do believe this creates a great vision for our state. Thank you, Senator. Yes, thank you very much, Eddie, and keep us all informed on what can be done to be a little more proactive in the uh, job training arena, whether it's community colleges or apprenticeship programs or uh, funding to bring it out because getting that uh, experience in a timely way could be very helpful to all because we want everyone to benefit from this change to a new cleaner uh, energy future. So thank you very much, Eddie, for your background and representation and your passion for what you do. So let's go on to Jeff, because you mentioned job training. So I think uh, Jeff Unterlach with Operating Engineers is the perfect person to uh, sort of end this discussion with any responses he has. Hey, Jeff. And you're I, I from Humboldt City, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, hey, I want to thank you uh, for the opportunity to speak today. And uh, with all the uh, good fortune from uh, all the uh, previous speakers and uh, what they had to say, uh, it's right on track with uh, uh, the discussion. And, and I wanted to take the discussion on with, with uh, from labor and, you know, the job aspect. I mean, we hear, we hear all the numbers and all the reports and all the good things. And really, uh, it's it's going to come down to, you know, the amount of gigawatts California is going to allow to happen, or uh, we're going to get on board to do. So I know from that aspect, uh, I can talk about Humboldt, uh, Humboldt County, port revitalization. Depending on what's going to happen with the grid, um, is going to depend on what's going to happen across the board here in California. So from the labor aspect, of course, we want to do 10 gigawatts here off of uh, California coastline. Of course, uh, in the North State, even though we have the most magnificent uh, underutilized uh, port here in Humboldt County, and we have a plan here locally, uh, you know, for job creation and revitalization of our port, uh, that's going to depend, again, on how much transmission can be put out in California, the upgraded transmission. And that's what uh, you know I'm continually talking about uh, here locally, along with other local leaders and uh, our stakeholders from the tribes to the fishermen, to the local residents, uh, we all have to be involved. Uh, so, you know, I'm for the jobs and I think everybody look, uh, we're, we're for, we're, labor wants for the jobs, but we also are for the environment 
Everybody thinks we just want to go out and build stuff. Well, that's true, but we want to do it environmentally sensitive. We want to be part of the solution for our climate change uh, all the way down, you know, to the bottom of California to the top. And uh, I'm grateful to be here and be part of the discussion. But I do know that we're ready here in Humboldt County and we're ready to, uh, you know, not be shipping things in. Of course, it'll probably start out that way with some of the wind turbines and stuff because we wanna get going just as fast as we can, but we wanna have manufacturing here in Humboldt County. We have the room, uh, we wanna have uh, upgraded transmission up here and it's gonna take a coalition other than just what's here. We need the federal government. And of course, Biden team was up here last Monday along with Congressman Huffman and uh, Commissioner Douglas. Uh, We're grateful to have them looking and being here. So we just want to move forward with this and be able to help. But it all comes down to what California is going to do, uh, not just with, uh, um, you know, the offshore wind, what they're going to do with upgraded transmission, and what they're going to do with port development. I, I want to in with uh, thanking assembly member Chu and AB 525, uh, his push forward. We're behind him uh, uh, with that, uh, the co-sponsors, uh, state building trades along operating engineers also, along with Brightline Defense. You know, our coalition uh, with Brightline Defense and Environmental California has uh, worked together and it's very unique in this situation because we all agree on offshore wind and we all ab agree, you know, how do we get there? And uh, to be part of that team, uh, I am uh, extremely grateful. Uh, I can speak on behalf of labor that we are at the table and we have a lot of other folks that are coming to the table and that's what it's gonna take uh, to do this big vision. Arnold said it earlier, go big. And look, we want to go big and we don't want to go home without getting this to the finish line. So I thanks for the opportunity and any questions, anything I can do to help, uh, we're here for. Thank you. Jeff, you're in a perfect place to build that coalition on the ground instead of it coming from Sacramento or somewhere else. Um, get those fishermen and everyone else that's passionate about this. I know resiliency is a big thing to the North Coast. I'm friends with Jared Huffman and Mike McGuire and the whole team up there. Uh, that Everyone wants a win-win here. So you, you're in a perfect place to be in Humboldt having those community meetings or informal meetings uh, in someone's living room to just talk through uh, options. Um, the fact that it's so offshore, that helps in some cases um, as far as the disruption. You're right, the distribution lines and whether it's more microgrids, but the resiliency with power shutoffs and everything else is critically important um, as well as reaching all our renewable energy targets. So uh, you have a lot of work ahead, but you're in a perfect place. You can do this. I am thankful for that. You know, I am a Humboldt County resident. Yep. And uh yeah, we're looking forward to it. So yeah, it's not someone from LA telling them what to do, right? You <laughs> need to you need to be there. So thank you so much, all three of you. Uh, brilliant comments, really added to the discussion, and thank you very much for uh, waiting to respond after the other speakers. So let's go on to our last thing. This is the Q and A, but let me introduce to you uh, Deputy Chief of Staff for the USC Schwarzenegger Institute. That's Francisca Martinez. She works at USC, but for those of you Bruins or UCLA fans out there, she's a UCLA graduate in the Institute in the Environment. And uh, we have found that the USC Schwarzenegger Institute, we actually work with UCLA on climate and air pollution and other issues um, because uh, no one observes uh, sort of boundary lines when it comes to pollution. So we're regionally problem solvers. So Francisca, take take over for this for the any Q&A time we have left. Yes, thank you, Fran. And let's jump right into the Q&A. Uh, this question is for Professor Rose and Professor Wei. Um, Governor Schwarzenegger and Commissioner Hochschild mentioned the creation of up to 65,000 um, construction-related jobs 
And then in your presentation, Professor Rose, you mentioned the minimum of 97,000 construction related um, job years. Can you please give the audience um, a brief explanation and the difference between jobs and, and job years? I know that's something that we had been discussing um, in the last few weeks. So it'd be great if you could please clarify that. So Francisca, are we speaking specifically about the uh, question uh, comparing the 65,000 jobs and 95,000 jobs mentioned, or are you asking for a definition? Um, regarding the question that was mentioned on the 65 versus 95. Well, th that one uh, is due to just looking at two different parts of a table. And Dan uh, could present that, but it's basically one one of those numbers, the 65,000, as I recall, was associated with a lower bound number for the period 2030 to 2040, while the 95,000 was associated with the longer period of time all the way from 2020 to 2040. And, and by the way, the other part of the question relating to to jobs, um, if you if you say you're creating uh, 4,000 jobs that run over a period of time, it doesn't mean you're creating 4,000 new jobs each year. It's 4,000 jobs, for instance, that uh, have permanence. And so, for the operation period, we've got 4,000 jobs times. Uh, 4,500 jobs, for instance, times a 40-year useful life, which gets, gets us to that 180,000 jobs that I mentioned for the operating period. So that's the distinction between jobs and, and job years. Hope Perfect. I've answered both of those. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, this next question is from Wesley Whitaker, um, and it's basically on the differences uh, between shallow and deep water anchoring. And I'm gonna pair it with one another question that we received earlier. Um, is there an example of a wind farm that is as deep as the water depth um, off the coast of California? Or is California a leader in building the first wind farm in, in such deep waters? Is there one of our speakers that would like to answer this? Maybe I can uh, jump in here, Francisca. So hopefully, even in my remarks, I, I think that question came in before my remarks. So hopefully I answered some of that. But the difference between fixed bottom or shallow water uh, wind farms, which is predominantly what you see on the East Coast. So the, the water depths are very, very shallow, uh, you know, 10, 15, 20, up to about 40 meters. So so very shallow. So those are uh, fixed bottom structures that are, are uh, anchored or or put it right into the to the uh, the ocean floor. For floating, we're talking about much deeper waters uh, beyond 60 meters is the definition uh, that the industry uses for deep water uh, for uh, offshore wind. Um, and uh, there are a handful of examples. Uh, we've started to see, uh, I would say, what I would call pre-commercial arrays uh, be deployed and, and working. Actually, uh, I think Assembly Member Friedman will, will visit one of those in Portugal uh, later this year. It's called Windflow Atlantic. It's a uh, roughly 30 megawatt, um, three turbine array, and that's in fairly deep water. I think it's off the top of my head, I think it's around 200 meters or so. The, the water depths that we're talking about in California, both in the Humboldt and the Morro Bay call areas are, are a bit deeper. There are six, seven, 800 meters up to almost 900 meters. Um, so it is deeper from a floating wind standpoint, but that type of water depth is, is well known in offshore energy, uh, whether that be oil and gas, uh, wherever you operate in uh, those, those water depths, it's not um, unheard of. So there's no real concern at those, those water depths. Great, thank you. Um, our next question is from Steve Fox. Um, do any anticipated long-term climate change is related to when an ocean current affect the potential of current offshore wind power? And a follow-up is how will these resources be protected from potential enemies? Now, I would say it may, but it's not really um, yeah, significant. Uh, so we we are modeling uh, wind currents, you know, in the short, medium, and, and long term, of course. But we don't see any any major impact. Uh, you know, maybe from an optimization standpoint, we may you know tweak some things, just angle and angle of attack, those type of things. But nothing nothing significant long term. I'd say the only concern might be sea level rise, but I'm I'm sure planners who are working to expand ports or uh, work out transmission hookups will take that into account 
and and locate those properly. As far as protecting the uh, offshore wind platforms, you know, we have a lot of experience already in other types of offshore activities, especially uh, petroleum extraction, uh, where there are all kinds of protective mechanisms that have been established, not to mention, you know, military and satellite surveillance that uh, I think can be brought to bear. So I, I, don't, I don't think we've got that much to worry about as far as protecting these facilities. Thank you. This next question is from Greg Haas uh, to the report authors. The Biden administration has identified over four gigawatts of development, um, mostly in Humboldt and Morro Bay for California. And the report identifies 10 gigawatts of development. Where do you see the next approximate six gigawatts being developed? So Dan, do you want to uh, take um, that? You've investigated the, that a little more than I have. Yeah, um, I think um, there will be more additional uh, potential um, in both the central coast area and also more in the northern coastal area, especially you know after the um, Humboldt um, Bay area, they can um, address um, some other issues and challenges such as a specialized seaport um, that can accommodate the um, assembly and uh, manufacturing of the um, wind turbine components and also to um, solve of the transmission uh, uh, capacity issues. Um, we have um, much more potential for additional capacity here. We have a map in our report that uh, displays the various offshore wind areas in the state, and, and they're pretty plentiful. Thank you. And then a follow-up that I think would go well with that is if Humboldt is the best wind resource, um, why are the projected gigawatts to be installed there about half of what is projected for Morro Bay? I think it was kind of mentioned, but is the availability of transmission lines onshore the problem? Yeah, I believe um, that's one of the near-term concerns for um, you know um, more um, earlier development of those capacities in the northern coast area. Perfect, thank you. Um, and this is from Dalia Kruger. The process of getting permits takes five to seven years as per the um, Bureau of Ocean and Energy Management. What are the actions you plan to take to accelerate the process? What is the timeline to have the first floating wind farm installed in California? I'll take, I can take that, yeah. that one. Yeah, so you're exactly, or the, the question is exactly right. Um, uh, five to seven, four to six, somewhere in there. Uh, it is a long permitting process. Um, there are some, let's say some streamline activities that we're advocating for, but I think it's, it's realistic to say the second half of the 2020s is when we'll see the first floating wind farm uh, in, in California. Um, and, and hopefully, uh, you know, we've, we've always said, you know, 10 gigawatts by 2040, we've, you know, the interim target we've, we've advocated for is three gigawatts by 2030. I think that's a that's a reasonable target um, from what we see. Thank you. And I think we have time for one more question. Um, this is from Alex Spatteru. Sorry if I mispronounced that. Um, airborne wind energy systems can be implemented in a matter of months, not years, as far as offshore wind harvesting is concerned. Have airborne wind energy system solutions mounted on existing decommissioned ONG platforms been examined in the USC report? No, we have not examined them uh, at all. It's an interesting possibility. And again, I'd probably defer to a technical expert like Jonah. Anything to, to add? Yeah, I think the, the challenge, uh, if I understand that the technology that he's referring to is, is scale. Uh, so how much, uh, you know, it's megawatts and gigawatts we, we try to refer to and, and at scale. Um, uh, and, and that is really going to make the impact uh, that that both of you uh, reference in the study. And I think that's really important to, to think about scale and how much um, power we can bring on onshore. Awesome. Thank you. Unfortunately, we are running out of time. So um, we're, we'll be closing off our Q&A section for now. But if you have any other questions, please feel free to email them to me and I can forward them to the appropriate uh, person. My email is Francisca at SchwarzeneggerInstitute.com and I'll type it in the chat box as well. Um, but I just really wanna say thank you to all of our speakers for joining us today in this 
really timely and important conversation. Um, I look forward to, to continue working with you all through the Institute and um, just really making offshore one happen in California. Thank you to our partners as well, the Energy Foundation, American Clean Power and Offshore One California for being supportive um, throughout this entire process. Uh, we really enjoyed working with you and look forward to continue doing so in the in the future and to our audience thank you for taking the time to join um, in this you know wednesday evening wednesday afternoon if you want to stay in touch um, and follow the schwarzenegger institute and the work that we continue to do please check out our website and join our mailing list to to stay up to date and thank you again everyone i hope you enjoy and have a wonderful rest of your evening